Part 2 1. The day before the wedding was not like any day that F. Jasmine had ever known. It was the Saturday she went into the town, and suddenly, after the closed blank summer, the town opened before her, and in a new way she belonged. Because of the wedding, F. Jasmine felt connected with all she saw, and it was as a sudden member that on this Saturday she went around the town. She walked the streets entitled as a queen and mingled everywhere. It was the day when, from the beginning, the world seemed no longer separate from herself, and when all at once she felt included. Therefore, many things began to happen. Nothing that came about surprised F. Jasmine, and, until the last at least, all was natural in a magic way. At the country house of an uncle of John Henry, Uncle Charles, she had seen old blinded mules going round and round in the same circle, grinding juice from the sugar cane for syrup. In the sameness of her tracks that summer, the old Frankie had somehow resembled that country mule. In town, she browsed around the counters of the ten-cent store, or sat on the front row of the palace show, or hung around her father's store, or stood on street corners watching soldiers. Now, this morning was altogether different. She went into places she had never dreamed of entering until that day. For one thing, F. Jasmine went to a hotel. It was not the finest hotel in the town, or even the next to the finest, but nevertheless, it was a hotel, and F. Jasmine was there. Furthermore, she was there with a soldier, and that, too, was an unforeseen event, as she had never in her life laid eyes on him until that day. Only yesterday, if the old Frankie had glimpsed a box-like vision of the scene as a view seen through a wizard's periscope, she would have bunched her mouth with unbelief. But it was a morning when many things occurred, and a curious fact about this day was a twisted sense of the astonishing. The unexpected did not make her wonder, and only the long-known, the familiar, struck her with a strange surprise. The day began when she waked up at dawn, and it was as though her brother and the bride had, in the night, slept on the bottom of her heart, so that the first instant she recognized the wedding. Next, and immediately, she thought about the town. Now that she was leaving home, she felt in a curious way as though on this last day the town called to her and was now waiting. The windows of her room were cool dawn blue. The old cock at the McKean's was crowing. Quickly, she got up and turned on the bed lamp and the motor. It was the old Frankie of yesterday who had been puzzled, but F. Jasmine did not wonder any more. Already she felt familiar with the wedding for a long, long time. The black dividing night has something to do with this. In the twelve years before, whenever a sudden change had come about, there was a certain doubt during the time when it was happening. But after sleeping through a night, and on the very next day, the change did not seem so sudden after all. Two summers passed, when she had traveled with the Wests to Port St. Peter on the Bay, the first sea evening with the scalloped gray ocean and empty sand was to her like a foreign place, and she had gone around with slanted eyes and put her hands on things in doubt. But after the first night, as soon as she awoke next day, it was as though she had known Port St. Peter all her life. Now it was likewise with the wedding. No longer questioning, she turned to other things. She sat at her desk wearing only the blue and white striped trousers of her pajamas, which were rolled up above the knees, vibrating her right foot on the ball of her bare foot and considering all that she must do on this last day. Some of these things she could name to herself, but there were others that could not be counted on her fingers or made into a list with words. To start with, she decided to make herself some visiting cards with Miss F. Jasmine Adams Esquire, engraved with squinted letters on a tiny card. So she put on her green visor eyeshade, cut up some cardboard, and fitted ink pens behind both ears. But her mind was restless and zigzagged to other things, 
and soon she began to get ready for town. She dressed carefully that morning in her most grown and best, the pink organdy, and put on lipstick and sweet serenade. Her father, a very early riser, was stirring in the kitchen when she went downstairs. Good morning, Papa. Her father was Royal Quincy Adams, and he owned a jewelry store just off the main street of town. He answered her with a kind of grunt, for he was a grown person who liked to drink three cups of coffee before he started conversation for the day. He deserved a little peace and quiet before he put his nose down to the grindstone. F. Jasmine had heard him bungling about his room when once she waked up to drink water in the night, and his face was pale as cheese this morning. His eyes had a pink and ragged look. It was a morning when he despised a saucer because his cup would rattle against it and not fit. So he put his cup down on the table or stove top until brown circles were left all over everywhere and flies settled in quiet rings. There was some sugar spilt on the floor, and each time his step made a gritty sound, his face shivered. This morning, he wore a pair of saggy kneed gray trousers and a blue shirt unfastened at the collar and with the tie loose. Since June, she had had this secret grudge against him that almost she did not admit. Since the night, he had asked who was the great big blunderbuss who still wanted to sleep with her old papa. But now, she had this grudge no longer. All of a sudden, it seemed to F. Jasmine that she saw her father for the first time, and she did not see him only as he was at that one minute, but pictures of the old days swirled in her mind and crossed each other. Remembrance, changing and fast, made F. Jasmine stop very still and stand with her head cocked, watching him both in the actual room and from somewhere inside her. But there were things that must be said, and when she spoke, her voice was not unnatural. Papa, I think I ought to tell you now, I am not coming back here after the wedding. He had ears to hear with, loose large ears with lavender rims, but he did not listen. He was a widow man, for her mother had died the very day that she was born, and as a widow man, set in his ways. Sometimes, especially in the early morning, he did not listen to things she said or new suggestions, so she sharpened her voice and chiseled the words into his head. I have to buy a wedding dress and some wedding shoes and a pair of pink sheer stockings. He heard and, after consideration, gave her a permission nod. The grits boiled slowly with blue, gluey bubbles, and as she set the table, she watched him and remembered. There were the winter mornings with frost flowers on the window panes and the roaring stove and the look of his brown, crusty hand as he leaned over her shoulder to help with the hard part of the last-minute arithmetic that she was working at the table, his voice explaining. Blue, long spring evenings she also saw, and her father on the dark front porch with his feet propped on the banisters, drinking the frosted bottles of beer he had sent her to bring home from Finney's place. She saw him bent over the workbench down at the store, dipping a tiny spring in gasoline, or whistling and peering with his round jeweler's glass into a watch. Remembrances came sudden and swirled, each colored with its own season, and for the first time she looked back on all the twelve years of her life and thought of them from a distance as a whole. Papa, she said, I will write you letters. Now he walked the dawn's stale kitchen like a person who has lost something but has forgotten what it is that he has lost. Watching him, the old grudge was forgotten, and she felt sorry. He would miss her in the house all by himself when she was gone. He would be lonesome. She wanted to speak some sorry words and love her father, but just at that moment, he cleared his throat in the special way he used when he was going to lay down the law to her, and said, Will you please tell me what has become of the monkey wrench? and the screwdriver that were in my tool chest on the back porch. The monkey wrench and the screwdriver. F. Jasmine stood with her shoulders hunched, her left foot drawn up to the calf of the right leg. I borrowed them, Papa. Where are they now? F. Jasmine considered, over at the West's. 
Now pay attention and listen to me, her father said, holding the spoon that had been stirring the grits and shaking it to mark the words. If you don't have the sense and the judgment to leave things alone, he stared at her in a long and threatening way and finished, you'll have to be taught. From now on, you walk the chalk line or you'll have to be taught. He sniffed suddenly. Is that toast burning? It was still early in the morning when F. Jasmine left the house that day. The soft gray of the dawn had lightened, and the sky was the wet, pale blue of a watercolor sky, just painted and not yet dried. There was a freshness in the bright air and cool dew on the burnt brown grass. From a backyard down the street, F. Jasmine could hear children's voices. She heard the calling voices of the neighborhood children who were trying to dig a swimming pool. They were all sizes and ages, members of nothing, and in the summers before, the old Frankie had been like leader or president of the swimming pool diggers in that part of town. But now that she was 12 years old, she knew in advance that, though they would work and dig in various yards, not doubting to the very last the cool, clear swimming pool of water, it would all end in a big, wide ditch of shallow mud. Now, as F. Jasmine crossed her yard, she saw in her mind's eye the swarming children and heard from down the street their chanting cries. And this morning, for the first time in her life, she heard a sweetness in these sounds, and she was touched. And, strange to say, her own home yard, which she had hated, touched her a little too. She felt she had not seen it for a long time. There, under the elm tree, was her old cold drink store, a light packing case that would be dragged around according to the shade, with a sign reading, Do Drop In. It was the time of morning when, the lemonade in a bucket underneath the store, she used to settle herself with her bare feet on the counter and a Mexican hat tilted down over her face her eyes closed, smelling the strong smell of sun-warm straw, waiting. And sometimes there would be customers, and she would send John Henry to the A.M.P. to buy some candy. But other times, the tempter Satan got the best of her, and she drank up all the stock instead. But now, this morning, the store looked very small and staggered, and she knew that she would never run it any more. F. Jasmine thought of the whole idea as something over and done with that had happened long ago. A sudden plan came to her. After tomorrow, when she was with Janice and Jarvis in the far place where they would be, she would look back on the old days and... But this was a plan F. Jasmine did not finish, for as the names lingered in her mind, the gladness of the wedding rose up inside her, and although the day was an August day, she shivered. The main street, too, seemed to F. Jasmine like a street returned to after many years, although she had walked up and down it only Wednesday. There were the same brick stores, about four blocks of them, the big white bank, and in the distance the many-windowed cotton mill. The wide street was divided by a narrow aisle of grass on either side of which the cars drove slowly in a browsing way. The glittering gray sidewalks and passing people the striped awning over the stores, all was the same, yet, as she walked the street that morning, she felt free as a traveler who had never seen the town before. And that was not all. She had no sooner walked down the left side of the main street and up again on the right sidewalk when she realized a further happening. It had to do with various people, some known to her and other strangers she met and passed along the street. An old colored man, stiff and proud on his rattling wagon seat, drove a sad, blinded mule down toward the Saturday market. F. Jasmine looked at him, he looked at her, and to the outward appearance, that was all. But in that glance, F. Jasmine felt between his eyes and her own eyes a new unnameable connection, as though they were known to each other. And there even came an instant vision of his home field and country roads and quiet dark pine trees as the wagon rattled past her on the paved town street. And she wanted him to know her, too, about the wedding. Now the same thing happened again and again on those four blocks, with the lady going into McDougal's store, with the small man waiting for the bus before the big First National Bank, 
with a friend of her father's called Tuck Ryan. It was a feeling impossible to explain in words, and later when she tried to tell of it at home, Bernice raised up her eyebrows and dragged the word in a mocking way. Connection, connection, but nevertheless, it was there, this feeling, a connection close as answers to calls. Furthermore, on the sidewalk before the First National Bank, she found a dime, and any other day, that would have been a grand surprise, but now this morning, she only paused to shine the dime on her dress front and put it in her pink pocketbook. Under the fresh blue early sky, the feeling as she walked along was one of newly risen lightness, power, entitlement. It was in a place called the Blue Moon that she first told about the wedding, and she came to the Blue Moon in a roundabout way, as it was not on the main street, but on the street called Front Avenue, which bordered the river. She was in this neighborhood because she had heard the organ of the monkey and the monkey man and had set out immediately to find them. She had not seen the monkey and the monkey man through the whole summer, and it seemed a sign to her that she should run across them on this last day in town. She had not seen them for so long that sometimes she thought the pair of them might even be dead. They did not go around the streets in wintertime, for the cold wind made them sick. They went south in October to Florida and came back to the town in warm late spring. They, the monkey and the monkey man, wandered to other towns also, but the old Frankie would come across them on various shaded streets through all the summer she could remember, except this one. He was a darling little monkey, and the monkey man was nice also. The old Frankie had always loved them, and now she was dying to tell her plans and let them know about the wedding. So when she first heard the broken-sounding faint organ, she went at once in search of it, and the music seemed to come from near the river on Front Avenue. So she turned from the main street and hurried down the side street, but just before she reached Front Avenue, the organ stopped. And when she gazed up and down the avenue, she could not see the monkey or the monkey man, and all was silent and they were nowhere in sight. They had stopped, maybe, in a doorway or a shop, so F. Jasmine walked slowly with a watchful air. Front Avenue was a street that had always drawn her, although it had the sorriest, smallest stores in town. On the left side of the street there were warehouses, and in between were glimpses of brown river and green trees. On the right side there was a place with a sign reading, Prophylactic Military, the business of which had often puzzled her. Then, other various places, a smelly fish shop with the shocked eyes of a single fish staring from some crushed ice in the window. A pawn shop, a second-hand clothing store with out-of-style garments hanging from the narrow entrance, and a row of broken shoes lined up on the sidewalk outside. Then, finally, there was the place called the Blue Moon. The street itself was cobbled with brick, and angry looking in the glare, and along the gutter she passed some eggshells and rotten lemon peels. It was not a fine street, but nevertheless, the old Frankie had liked to come here now and then at certain times. The street was quiet in the mornings and on the weekday afternoons, but toward evening, or on holidays, the street would fill up with the soldiers who came from the camp nine miles away. They seemed to prefer Front Avenue to almost any other street, and sometimes the pavement resembled a flowing river of brown soldiers. They came to town on holidays and went around in glad, loud gangs together, or walked the sidewalks with grown girls, and the old Frankie had always watched them with a jealous heart. They came from all over the whole country and were soon going all over the world. They went around in gangs together, those lasting twilights of the summertime, while the old Frankie, dressed in her khaki shorts and Mexican hat, watched from a distance by herself. Noises and weathers of distant places seemed to hover about them in the air. She imagined the many cities that these soldiers came from and thought of the countries where they would go, while she was stuck there in the town forever. And stealing jealousy sickened her heart. But now this morning, her heart was occupied with one intention, to tell of the wedding and her plans. So, after walking down the burning pavement, hunting for the monkey and the monkey man, 
she came to the blue moon, and it occurred to her that maybe they were there. The blue moon was a place at the end of Front Avenue, and often the old Frankie had stood out on the sidewalk with her palms and nose pressed flat against the screen door, watching all that went on there. Customers, most of them soldiers, sat at the booth tables or stood at the counter having drinks or crowded around the jukebox. Here sometimes there were sudden commotions. Late one afternoon when she passed the blue moon, she heard wild, angry voices and a sound like a bottle being thrown. And as she stood there, a policeman came out on the sidewalk, pushing and jerking a torn looking man with wobbly legs. The man was crying, shouting. There was blood on his ripped shirt and dirty tears dripped down his face. It was an April afternoon of rainbow showers and by and by the black Mariah screamed down the street and the poor arrested criminal was thrown into the prisoner's cage and carried off down to the jail. The old Frankie knew the blue moon well, although she had never been inside. There was no written law to keep her out, no lock and chain on the screen door, but she had known in an unworded way that it was a forbidden place to children. The blue moon was a place for holiday soldiers and the grown and free. The old Frankie had known she had no valid right to enter there, so she had only hung around the edges, and never once had she gone inside. But now, this morning before the wedding, all of this was changed. The old laws she had known before meant nothing to F. Jasmine, and, without a second thought, she left the street and went inside. There in the blue moon was the red-headed soldier who was to weave in such an unexpected way through all that day before the wedding. F. Jasmine, however, did not notice him at first. She looked for the monkey man, but he was not there. Aside from the soldier, the only other person in the room was the blue moon owner, a Portuguese who stood behind the counter. This was the person F. Jasmine picked to be the first to hear about the wedding and he was chosen simply because he was the one most likely and near. After the fresh brightness of the street, the blue moon seemed dark. Blue neon lights burned over the dim mirror behind the counter, tinting the faces in the place pale green, and an electric fan turned slowly so that the room was scalloped with warm, stale waves of breeze. At that early morning hour, the place was very quiet. There were booth tables across the room, all empty. At the back of the blue moon, a lighted wooden stairway led up to the second floor. The place smelled of dead beer and morning coffee. F. Jasmine ordered coffee from the owner behind the counter, and after he brought it to her, he sat down on a stool across from her. He was a sad, pale man with a very flat face. He wore a long white apron, and hunched on the stool with his feet on the rungs. He was reading a romance magazine. The telling of the wedding gathered inside her, and when it was so ready she could no longer resist, she hunted in her mind a good opening remark, something grown and offhand to start between them the conversation. She said in a voice that trembled a little, It certainly has been an unseasonable summer, hasn't it? The Portuguese at first did not seem to hear her and went on reading the romance magazine. So she repeated her remark, and when his eyes were turned to hers and his attention caught, she went on in a higher voice, Tomorrow, this brother of mine and his bride are marrying at Winter Hill. She went straight to the story as a circus dog breaks through the paper hoop, and as she talked, her voice became clearer, more definite and sure. She told her plans in a way that made them sound completely settled and not in the least open to question. The Portuguese listened with his head cocked to one side, his dark eyes ringed with ash-gray circles, and now and then he wiped his damp, veined, dead white hands on his stained apron. She told about the wedding and her plans, and he did not dispute with her or doubt. It is far easier, it came to her as she remembered Bernice, to convince strangers of the coming to pass of dearest wants than those in your own home kitchen. The thrill of speaking certain words, Jarvis and Janice, Wedding and Winter Hill, 
was such that F. Jasmine, when she had finished, wanted to start all over again. The Portuguese took from behind his ear a cigarette, which he tapped on the counter but did not light. In the unnatural neon glow, his face looked startled, and when she had finished, he did not speak. With the telling of the wedding still sounding inside her, as the last chord of a guitar murmurs a long time after the strings are struck, F. Jasmine turned toward the entrance and the frame-blazing street beyond the door. Dark people passed along the sidewalk, and footsteps echoed in the blue moon. It gives me a funny feeling she said, after living in this town all my life, to know that after tomorrow I'll never be back here any more. It was then she noticed him for the first time, the soldier who at the very end would twist so strangely that last long day. Later, on thinking back, she tried to recall some warning hint of future craziness, but at the time he looked to her like any other soldier, standing at a counter drinking beer. He was not tall, nor short, nor fat, nor thin. Except for the red hair, there was nothing at all unusual about him. He was one of the thousands of soldiers who came to the town from the camp nearby. But as she looked into this soldier's eyes, in the dim light of the blue moon, she realized that she gazed at him in a new way. That morning, for the first time, F. Jasmine was not jealous. He might have come from New York or California, but she did not envy him. He might have been on his way to England or India. She was not jealous. In the restless spring and crazy summer, she had watched the soldiers with a sickened heart, for they were the ones who came and went, while she was stuck there in the town forever. But now, on this day, before the wedding, all this was changed. Her eyes, as she looked into the soldier's eyes, were clear of jealousy and want. Not only did she feel that unexplainable connection she was to feel between herself and the other total strangers that day, there was another sense of recognition. It seemed to F. Jasmine they exchanged the special look of friendly, free travelers who meet for a moment at some stop along the way. The look was long. And with the lifting of the jealous weight, F. Jasmine felt at peace. It was quiet in the blue moon, and the telling of the wedding seemed still to murmur in the room. After this long gaze of fellow travelers, it was the soldier who finally turned his face away. Yes, said F. Jasmine, after a moment and to no one in particular. It gives me a mighty funny feeling. In a way, it's like I ought to do all things I would have done if I was staying in the town forever, instead of this one day. So I guess I better get a move on. Adios. She spoke the last word to the Portuguese, and at the same time, her hand reached automatically to lift the Mexican hat she had worn all summer until that day. But finding nothing, the gesture withered and her hand felt shamed. Quickly, she scratched her head, and with a last glance at the soldier, left the blue moon. It was the morning different from all other mornings she had ever known because of several reasons. First, of course, there was the telling of the wedding. Once and a long time ago, the old Frankie had liked to go around the town playing a game. She had walked all around through the north side of the town with the grass lawned houses and the sad mills section and the colored Sugarville, wearing her Mexican hat and the high laced boots and a cowboy rope tied round her waist. She'd gone around pretending to be Mexican. Me no speak English. Adios, buenas noches. Habla poqui piqui pu. She had jabbered and mocked Mexican. Sometimes a little crowd of children gathered, and the old Frankie would swell up with pride and trickery. But when the game was over and she was home, there would come over her a cheated discontent. Now this morning reminded her of those old days of the Mexican game. She went to the same places, and the people mostly strangers to her were the same. But this morning she was not trying to trick people and pretend. Far from it, she wanted only to be recognized for her true self. It was a need so strong, this want to be known and recognized, that F. Jasmine forgot 
the wild, hard glare and choking dust and miles, it must have been at least five miles, of wandering all over town. A second fact about that 